one of the things that I sort of figured out years ago on Battlestar Galactica is that there's, I think there's something called, you know, I call it cognitive load. Like the, the, the audience can only handle so much story. Think about like juggling balls, right? Like if you're juggling two balls, you can kind of do that's pretty easy. You juggle three, it gets a little harder, juggle four. And it's the same thing for human mental capacity, you know? So one of the things we try to do is, you know, make sure that the audience isn't juggling too many balls at any one time as we're moving through. And so it became really important to, you know, for me, since I'm a visual person, I wanted to be able to see in my timeline, which stories are cutting to which stories. Are we getting bogged down in a certain story? Are we cutting between too many stories at once? And so one of the techniques I used was I had my assistant editor color code all the different storylines. So for example, you know, Maeve, who's the madam at the Mariposa, you know, her storyline was purple or all the Delos storylines involving Ford, Anthony Hopkins character, or Jeffrey Wright were green, you know, so I could kind of visually just look at the timeline, but boy, we spent 10 minutes on this. We really, oh, wow, we've got, we're stacking up all these stories on top of each other. It's too confusing. And so the timeline became sort of a visual tool about how to distribute story and sort of how we're weaving this tapestry together. And we can show you that. You can see, you know, once we expand the timeline, how some of the different storylines, you know, so this makes it very, very easy to sort of navigate the timeline. You know, I can tell, you know, what storyline I'm in here, you know, and I, I know that, you know, this story, you know, will connect me into, you know, this part of the story, right? And I, if I collapse the timeline a little bit, I can see sort of how those things are distributed. And what you'll see is that, you know, in the early part of the timeline, I really just focused on a couple of different storylines, right? You can see the orange and the brown. I didn't want a, a little bit of yellow, right? A little bit of this story, but I didn't want to sort of, you know, one idea would be like, let's get all the stories going at once. Let's get all this plate spinning, right? Let's get all the balls in the air. And I felt that if we did that, it would um, all kind of fall apart, you know, <laughs> for the audience. The audience just wouldn't be able to track it the way I'd want them to be able to track it. So I kind of simplified the beginning and then slowly started to integrate in new storylines as, you know, we got deeper into the show. Um, and so we, you know, this, we evolved the structure. I evolved the structure together with Jonah Nolan, who's the writer, showrunner, director, and producer of the show, really the creative force of the show. Uh, you know, so we shoot on film, right? That's one of the crazy things about Westworld. We shoot on 35 millimeter film. Uh, the showrunners like the look and feel of film. Uh, we then scan that film and uh, we get DNX 36 uh, files in post-production, which the editor, the assistant editors then break down for us. And part of that breaking down on, on the finale was color coded for me. <laughs> um, some of the other color coding that we do in the timeline is also just based on, uh, you see the audio tracks here, um, you know, different kinds of sound effects, whether they're backgrounds versus hard effects, we color code different ways, uh, music, although for some reason the music, the score on this is not uh, color coded, but you know, it also just visually helps orient myself in the timeline, you know, this is sound effect, that score, this is background, that sort of thing, very quickly. The other thing that I love that was introduced in Avid, you know, we've always had dupe detection, uh, which means, you know, the, the timeline will show you where you're using a duplicate piece of media, du duplicate frame. Now, this was important when we're shooting on film because if you're cutting negative, every time you cut the negative, you lose a frame, you can't, you can't duplicate frames, right? Today, it doesn't really matter for, for what we do since we deliver digitally, but what it does tell me is what pieces are contiguous. And that also allowed me to look at the, the audio in a timeline and kind of know where does dialogue reconnect to it? You know, where, if I have two pieces of dialogue that are split up, where can I connect them back together? So, you know, I really rely heavily on the, on the visual cues of the timeline to help me edit. So you'll see in this timeline, there's a bunch of, you know, there's places where, you know, we have a lot of stacked uh, media. And what that represents, you know, each one of those things represents sort of a different uh, visual effects, right? So there are places where, for example, here, um, you know, we have several tracks of video. And I think this one, I was, you know, it looks like I was doing a split screen. I can see uh, I was simply comping Ford's head, which was blocked by that big glass dome. 
sort of putting them back there in the background and then sort of cleaning it up, uh, sort of just sort of fixing, making the shot. And then VFX kind of redid it. So one of the things that I, you know, I work, tend to work on a lot of science fiction shows. And one of the things that's challenging about that is oftentimes we're trying to, you know, the visuals are things that we don't really have any corollary for in the real world. You know, they don't exist. You know, we're showing things that are not there. So one of the things I, you know, I've just become good at over the years is comping temp effects because it's very important for the pacing of, of a show or of an edit to, you know, be able to know, you know, how long is this thing going to take? How long do we need to hang on the shot to sort of make this story point or show this, this world? So we spend a lot of time in post, you know, we don't, we don't go to after effects. We do it right in, right in Avid. And one of the interesting aspects of the show is that, you know, the characters are in loops, right? And so sometimes, you know, when we repeat a loop, we'll reshoot parts of the loop to show it from a different point of view, from different characters' point of view or different side. But oftentimes we're going back and mining takes that were shot for the, sort of the, the original version of that scene and sort of like me melding them together. You know, there's a moment towards the end where, you know, we sort of realize, you know, it's the big reveal here of uh, where, where we find out that the man in black or William is actually the man in black, right? And so part, some of these shots in this scene were originally shot for the pilot. Um, you'll see where she drops the can, right? And some of the background shots and things that we used to establish the scene. But, you know, this was essentially, you know, a scene that was shot in a pilot that we reshot for the finale. And there's different iterations of that throughout the season. And then, uh, you know, like, so here's, a, here's an example where, you know, we kind of, you know, shot a, tr a, a, a transition that I had to clean up where the hats didn't really match from one to the other. So like, there's the B side. Yeah, so there's, there's the A side. And then I sort of had to draw a mat around the hat to keep the band of the hat moving back as it became the man in black. So little things like that, you know, we'll do to sort of clean up. So what I typically do is um, I cut scene by scene. I cut in individual scenes, and then I'll start to build those scenes into sort of 10-minute segments, which I'll hand to my assistant editor, who will then start to sort of lay in backgrounds, sound effects, things like that. And so we just sort of evolved the cut. And I think with the finale, what I did was I split it because it was so long. I split it into two sections, part one and part two. Each of them were about 45 minutes. Just so like if I was working on one part, I could hand, if I was working on part one, I could hand part two to my assistant, let her work on it for a while and vice versa. This is a scene where Dolores, Evan, Evan Rachel Wood is, you know, left alone down in this sort of, you know, tech room, diagnostic room with Bernard. Now, for some reason, this was a visual effect. I'm not sure why I see, because she walks past, there's an empty chair. And as she comes into the room, he's there. And I guess they could have just had the actor sort of like step in and sit down, but they decided to shoot it as sort of a, as a motion control, but without really motion control, with a, just with a dolly. So the, the clean plate is, you know, she walks in, there's no one there, sits down, and then we comped in Jeffrey Wright kind of added it into the scene. But the really complex one is where the camera sort of swings around. So she's, she's talking to him and she go, kind of goes into a fugue state. And as the camera moves, I'll show you sort of what the, uh, what the plate was. So he's sitting there. And as the camera moves around, he's sort of in the seat there, right? But the whole point is that we're, she's talking to, Dolores is gonna be now talking to Dolores Prime. So what we did was, we, they shot, you know, the same move on the dolly, you know, the, the real way to do it is on a robot arm or with a motion control rig, but they just did it with a dolly. And uh, as the camera moves, we cut into right in here, we, we sort of mat in the other Dolores. So, but then the problem is we've got <laughs> Dolores Prime talking to the Dolores stand in the Dolores double, right? You can see over, we're over the shoulder. That's not actually Evan Rachel Wood. So then to make it even more complicated, we had to find a way to mat her in with herself. So, you know, they shot three passes and all on a dolly. Dollies don't always move the same speed. So I had to kind of find which ones were in sync with the other, you know, like 
It was like multiple sort of efforts, like, okay, this one kind of looks like it fits, and this one kind of looked like, anyway, we got it to kind of work out. But all this, you know, this is pretty seamless, and it's all done right in Media Composer, you know? When a visual effects involves performance, you know, you want to pick the right performance and make sure the visual effects guys are getting the right performance, not rely on them to sort of pick the shot. And really the thing is, is as editors, at sort of every level, we're trying to make something as finished as possible. We're trying to sell it first to the director, you know, like show them a proof of concept, show them what they did in the best possible form. Uh, and from there, we're selling to the producer. You know, we're trying, you know, we're trying to make the most convincing, most compelling story at, at every level. And why shouldn't we, you know? And so we're doing that with temp visual effects. We're doing that with sound design and mixing. In the case of feature films, oftentimes they're doing 5-1 mixes in the Avid that they're then taking to temp, you know, to, to previews and things like that. So, and, and the Avid, you know, it's, it's just such a great tool. It allows us to do all that kind of stuff uh, very quickly. You know, I, you know, like this, you know, maybe because I was trying to match up things, you know, I spent maybe 35 minutes, you know, 35 to 40 minutes, you know, trying to just figure out which pieces fit together and you're moving on, you know. Some of these markers were created by my, my assistant editor. You know, a lot of them are for tracking visual effects. So you'll see, you know, these are visual effect numbers, you know, Westworld 110, that refers to the episode number, the scene and the shot number. Um, let's see. And then there's also things that I added here, you know, new VFX D blink, you know, there's like, I probably just took out somebody's blink. Uh, and that's particularly like because, you know, we have robots that freeze, you know, we'll have to freeze them, stop them from blinking, that sort of thing. Um, here I had a note to discuss with Jay. Jay Wirtz, our visual effects supervisor. So for me, it's just a, like a convenient way to make notes. Uh, this one was um, because the shot was a blow up, I gave them a note to rescan it at a higher resolution because I didn't want to lose, I didn't want to get pixelation when we're, when we're resizing the shot digitally, things like that. But yeah, I mean, we, we you can see we rely on, on markers pretty heavily as a way to communicate. And I can leave notes in there for my assistant to go in and, and do things. You know, wherever we ADR'd somebody in there, um, a lot of times, you know, the, the writers or producers will say, hey, we need someone to say this, you know, and I'll record it in a microphone, throw it in the timeline. And uh, someone, you know, group loop or somebody will redo it later. You know, I think season one, we had, you know, we had three editors, three assistants, a VFX editor. At some point, I think we had sort of a promo. So we had seven or eight Avid systems set up on a Avid ISIS. Um, so we're all sharing the same media. We all, all have access to everybody else's projects. And what we do, you can see in the top of the bin here, we have folders, two Charles. Charles was my assistant editor, season one, two Eric. That's the, that was the visual effects editor. So when I needed to pass him something, I would put it in the two bin, you know, and I would just send him an email like, hey, check out the sequence in the two bin this is what I need you to do, you know? And so it's just really quickly, we can pass stuff back and forth. They can pass it back to me. I can drop it in. So, and it, and it all works seamlessly. You know, it's really, really kind of amazing. Here we have just sort of how the project's organized. You know, here's all the cuts. You can see like there's like multiple, multiple like directors. Every show is different. You know, I've worked on shows where it's like a 13 to one ratio. So for, you know, every hour they're shooting 13 hours. Westworld, you know, um, it's fairly conservative because we're shooting film, even though we're shooting three perf. You know, they shoot two, three takes, you know, not a very high ratio. Part of the fun of working on a show like Westworld is that we get to really build an intricate machine, you know, and we are very aware of it. You know, one of the things that we try to do with the multiple, because you keep asking about the multiple timelines, you know, we never wanted to, to, cut, to cut directly from William to the man in black because they're the same character in different timelines as if it was happening minutes later. So oftentimes what we did was, you know, we simply cut to black, like, you know, in the show, we just cut to black and then fade it up or, you know, spend a couple seconds in black. And then it's like, here's timeline two, you know? So it's a way of sort of playing fair with the audience. And we did a lot of little things like that where we'd, put little things in that if you went back and watched the second time, you'd say, oh, I see, that makes sense. That's why, you know, that's why they did it.